um, our panel, uh, uh, we decided to focus on culture because most of the time that's something that we really don't focus on uh, when we speak about the Naxa or uh, the, war, the Six Day War of 1967. We tend to focus on the political ramifications of this event and that uh, has been the case, I think, um, in many, uh, many conferences and, and, of course, many books as well. So we wanted actually to take a, a, a different direction and see the invisible work of, of uh, many of the artists and uh, filmmakers and to see the ways in which um, 50 years after 67, how this event still reverberates, um, um, you know, uh, in the early responses as much as in the late responses. Even though, you know, the idea of um, pan-Arabism has almost disappeared, although ideas really hardly disappear, as we know, much less ideals, if we think about pan-Arabism as an ideal, of course. Uh, that's something uh, we can hopefully perhaps discuss. So anyway, um, we lined up three speakers for this panel, distinguished speakers and guests uh, um, whose work has been very influential even for, you know, for, for many of us, uh, including students and myself. And um, we're going to start with um, Nadia Aqoub, who's an associate, associate professor of Arabic language and cultures at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is the author of Pans, Swords, and the Spring of Art, the Oral Poetry Dueling of Palestinian Weddings in the Galilee. Um, and numerous articles and book chapters about Arabic literature and film. She's also the co-editor of Rula Huas uh, Bad Girls of the Arab World, which is forthcoming from the University of Texas Press. Is it? How? No, not September. yet? September. Okay, very good. September. Okay. Um, her book, Manuscript, Palestinian Cinema in the Days of Revolution, is currently under review. And um, she will be presenting on viewing 1967 Arab cinema in the 2010. And I will actually introduce uh, our two other speakers and before I disappear from here. <laughs> um, um, this, uh, our second speaker is going to be um, Hossam Abu Laila. And Hossam is an associate professor uh, in the University of Houston Department of English. He's the translator of four Arabic novels and the author of critical articles in the areas of literature, of the Americas, Literary Theory, and Arab Cultural Studies. He's the author of Other South, Faulkner, Coloniality, and the Mertiagi Tradition, co-editor with Gayatri Spivak of the Seagull Books series, Elsewhere Texts, and a series editor of the Seagull Books Arabic List as well. His book-length study of US imperial culture as read through the lens of cultural critical theory from the Global South will appear I hope, in 2018. Um, his, 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 his title, the title of his talk is um, Lacanian, Gizek, and, you know, uh, kind of pan, the 67 war did not take place. Arab intellectuals between critique and resistance. Uh, and our third speaker uh, is Elliot Kola. Elliot teaches uh, in the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies at Georgetown University. He's the author of Conflicted Antiquities, Egyptology, Egyptomania, Egyptian Modernity, from Duke University Press, 2007. He has translated um, uh, lots of novels uh, from Arabic literature, including most recently um, uh, Rabi al Madhun's The Lady from Tel Aviv. Rabi al Madhun, of course, was last year's winner of the Arabic Booker, uh, if you're following. Um, and Elliot will be um, speaking uh, today on Imperfect Reunion, the June War in Emily Habibi's six-day sextet text. Thank you all, and uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker. One of the immediate consequences of the 1967 Arab defeat was the rise of a new type of alternative cinema in the Arab world. Cinema already had a venerable history in the region, including the decades-old, vibrant commercial filmmaking of Egypt and more recent efforts throughout the region to develop public sector film industries as an integral part of modernization efforts of newly independent nations. 
1967, however, gave rise to organized efforts to create innovative political films outside existing state and commercial structures. In Egypt in 1968, a small group of young filmmakers formed the new cinema group, Jama'at al-Cinema al-Jadida, a production unit that sought to alter the cinema landscape by challenging the funding policies of public sector cinema. Film and photography units began to appear among the constitutive organizations of the Palestinian Liberation Organization at approximately the same time. In Syria, under the directorship of Abd al-Hamid Mar'i, a very young public sector film and television industry took a decidedly political turn, producing an impressive number of long and short works related to the rapidly developing Palestinian liberation movement. Further afield from Palestine and Morocco, Mohammed Afifi and Ahmad Bouamini, working independently, also produced exciting experimental works in the late 1960s. Within a very few years, politically engaged cinema would move beyond the confines of these nascent efforts led by individuals and small collectives to briefly dominate the region at least in terms of film writing and programming, if not exact, actually screen time and mass audiences. In 1972, the General Cinema Organization of Syria sponsored what was optimistically called the first International Young Filmmakers Film Festival in Damascus, there never was a second one, dedicated to alternative Arab cinema. That year, the JCC, the Carthage Film Festival in Tunisia, a biennial film festival that had been founded in 1966 took a decidedly militant turn in, in 1972, incorporating recurring themes, recurring themed programs dedicated to the liberation of Palestine and Africa into its schedule, and a new film movement, Cinema Jadid, that sought to turn the attention of Algerian cinema away from celebratory narratives about the Algerian revolution of the past toward contemporary issues arose at this time. It was during this period, roughly 1968 to the mid-70s, that many of what have come to be regarded as the classics of Arab political cinema, al Makhdoun, Basya Bahar, Al-Mumia, Al-Asfur, Kafir Qasim, etc., were made. A cinema institute was established within the PLO that produced its own <coughs> modest films, and over the course of a decade, fostered Palestinian filmmaking more broadly through co-productions and the sponsorship of filmmaking about Palestine outside the organization. In addition, a number of technically and aesthetically innovative works, including Christian Ghazi's masterful A Hundred Faces for a Single Day, made in 1971, a collage film reminiscent of Godard's Ici et Ailleurs, but predating it by four years, and a surprising number of experimental shorts, almost always politically motivated, were made within Syrian television as well. Since the turn of the 21st century, filmmakers, scholars, curators, and other cultural producers have directed their attention to the films from this period. These revisitings are what I am loose, of what I am loosely calling 67 Arab cinema have been undertaken largely outside the framework of major state or commercial institutions by individuals or small independent initiatives operating interstitially. They often involve scholars and or cultural producers living at least part-time in the diaspora, but much of it occurs in the Arab world itself, where curators and scholars grapple with conceptualizing national and regional cinema histories. Some of this work includes a romanticization of resistance during a political period of extreme hope and despair. Some involves ongoing solidarity work on the part of act activists outside the region. Some is also a part, part of, a, of nascent attempts to pull together histories of Arab cinema outside the frame of national cinemas. My own recent work has focused on Palestinian film of the 1970s and contemporary engagements with that era and the films it produced. Palestine was, of course, at the heart of the 1967 war and the political movements that emerged from it. And not surprisingly, in the years immediately following the war, a significant number of Arab films were made about Palestine. Many construed Palestine as an Arab loss and thus situated it within narrow nationalist narratives, but others addressed it as an emancipatory cause for the region as a whole. Recent uh, and ongoing 
uh, engagement with the latter type of material from the long 1970s uh, has approached the period from a number of different perspectives by reinserting images of militancy and optimism from a relatively recent Palestinian past into a dystopian present. In what remains of my time, I will outline some of the trends and projects that have emerged as Palestinians and others revisit these earlier works. In 1982, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the PLO lost five national archives, including the film and photography archive maintained by the Palestinian Cinema Institute. The idea of a lost archive is laden with romance. Its state of being lost suggests that it can be found again, giving rise to questions, speculation, and treasure hunting. It also resonates with people's conceptions of Palestinians as a people defined by loss. Less exciting, far more arduous, and more important have been the efforts to reassemble an archive from copies of films and other materials scattered throughout the world. When the PLO made films, uh, made films, they printed dozens, occasionally hundreds of copies, which were then sent to cultural centers or sold. <coughs> Palestinian materials also sit in archives of countries that co-produce Palestinian films, and some of the filmmakers maintain private archives. Since the early 2000s, there have been numerous efforts, too many for me to list here, um, uh, to gather and digitize scattered copies of the films. These restorative projects stand in marked contrast to visions of the archive as a, quote, permanently lost treasure. They counter the implicit understandings of the Palestinian revolution as a movement from the past with no relevancy to the much changed present by enacting an engagement with that past. The activities of these cultural actors also illustrate and enact the restorative and agential work to be done in the face of loss by engaging in an undoing of destruction and erasure. Beyond the Palestinian context, the international scope of such efforts restores not just the, the film archive itself, but also its embeddedness in the global political and cultural networks of the Palestinian revolution. In this regard, such efforts contribute to an understanding of third and third world cinema of the 1970s and 80s and their attendant political movements as a truly global phenomenon. Thus, efforts to restore the Palestinian film archive from materials scattered around the world are not merely nostalgic projects, but laden with meaning in the context of Palestinian and other post-Oslo Oslo politics. Beyond attempts to reconstruct the PLO archive, filmmakers have actively engaged directly with its images in works and initiatives that reclaim this period for Palestinian history. Old footage from PL the PLO period in Jordan and Lebanon appears frequently in recent films, always emphasizing the distance separating the present from the past, often nostalgically, but sometimes critically, and hence suggesting alternatives to a dystopian present. Relatedly, a number of films and art projects represent Palestinian refugee life and or the fideiin of the 60s and 70s in new fictional works. Notably, in When I Saw You, Lama Shuftuk, Anna Marie Jasser includes at least one direct quote to an earlier work, a move that suggests not only an engagement with the earlier period and its images, but also a desire to reclaim the earlier works as a living part of Palestinian film history. Artists have also begun to manipulate older material, uncovering, extracting, or creating new understandings. For example, the video installation and accompanying booklet, El Jisser, The Bridge, from 2012, by Subversive Films, examines and disrupts the use of iconic footage of Palestinians fleeing across the Jordan, the Jordan River during the 67 War, footage that has appeared re uh, repeatedly in Palestinian films since. By slowing down the footage and presenting it as a continuous loop, the artists encourage viewing it, viewers to actually see what the footage contains rather than what it has come to stand for through its repetitive use since 1967. In O Persecuted from 2014, video artist Basma Sharif offers a contemporary response to Qasem Hawa's uh, Marxist-Leninists Our Small Houses from 1974 a Sharif distorts and covers up the image and sound of the original film, allowing just parts and flashes of, of the image and text to emerge from an, a covering of black paint and distorted sound. 
The work emphasizes the distance separating the idealistic imaginings for the future of Palestine as a worker's utopia that is expressed in the piece from the 1970s from the objectification of women's bodies that underlies a hedonistic spring break culture of Tel Aviv's beaches. It also comments on the process of film restoration as one of imperfect and incomplete translation, thereby confirming the eternal pastness of the past. As a militant project of the long 1970s, the Palestinian revolution embraced violence primarily as a means of creating and sustaining the visibility for the Palestinian cause that was crucial to its political agency. Azal Hassan's film, Kings and Extras, Muluk wa Kampar, is constructed around a search for the missing PLO film archive, but the search is doomed from the start, and Al Hassan's real quest in the film is for an understanding of the cost and value of Palestinian images. Who has paid what price to produce Palestinian films and photographs in the past and the present, and what significance do they hold for Palestinians themselves? Al Hassan's search for the films eventually leads her to the Palestinian Martyr Cemetery in Beirut and the film ends with her wandering among its, gra its graves with former PLO filmmaker Qaysa Zubaydi. In this last scene, the cost of image making is explicitly conflated with the cost of armed struggle. The Palestinian revolution was not just or even primarily a movement dedicated to liberating the land of Palestine. It was also a movement that sought to endow individual Palestinians with political agency through a commitment to collective belonging. The PLO and its supporters produced relatively few films about this aspect of the revolution, that is, its institution building, which makes the works of Monica Maurer, a German filmmaker who worked with the Palestine Red Crescent Society in the late 70s and early 80s, particularly important. In Gaza Hospital from 2009, Italian filmmaker Marco Pasquini uses Monica Maurer's footage as well as interviews with international medical personnel who volunteered with the PRCS at the time as an attempt to animate a bleak present. The focus of the film is Gaza Hospital, one of several built by the PLO to provide modern medical care to Palestinians and other marginalized residents of Lebanon. Gaza Hospital was destroyed in 1982 and the subsequent camps war of the mid-1980s. It ceased functioning as a hospital but the decrepit shell of a building has served as a home for several families and businesses for the past 30 years. By moving repeatedly between contemporary footage of squalid but nonetheless homey spaces of indigenous families, indigenous families and Maurer's footage of competent medical care in a state-of-the-art facility from the earlier period, the latter appears not just as a past period to be mourned, but an achievement to be remembered as a first step towards agency in the present. The cooperation between local Palestinians and solidarity activists is key to the modest optimism of Pas Pasquini's film. Amelioration was and still is possible through a coming together to work as equals. Pasquini tells the story of Gaza Hospital not to mourn its passing, but to mine it for what it can offer the present, not just for Palestinians, but, the inter but for the international left. Most, more recently, May Masri's feature film, 3000 Nights from 2015, about a woman imprisoned while pregnant during the first intifada, also engages with the politics of the Palestinian revolution. Relying on extensive research into Palestinians and Israeli prisons, Masri's film narrates not just her protagonist's experiences as a young woman behind bars, but also her gradual politicization through that experience and her encounter with more politically engaged women there. Significantly, it is Leila's unwavering integrity and realization of the importance of a commitment to collective action, as much as her relationship with the volatile, suspicious, though ultimately positive character Sana, a P Sana, a PLO Fidaia, that leads Leila towards principal political commitment. 3,000 Nights ends with documentary footage of the release of thousands of Palestinians and Arab prisoners to the PLO in 1983 in exchange for six Israeli soldiers. Thus, Masri explicitly connects Leila's experience and hence the nonviolent resistance to occupation and political maturation to the legacy of the 1970s, 
while carefully distancing it from Palestinian political institutions of the post-Oslo period. In Trip Along Exodus, Hen Shufani paints a detailed portrait of her father, Ilyas Shufani, Palestinian intellectual who devoted himself to the revolution. Shufani emerges from the film as an extraordinarily consistent man, committed both to his own political perspective, which over time led him to distance himself from the PLO under Yasser Arafat and to the people with whom he has thrown his lot. Hinda Shufani's perspective as the daughter of an absent father living and working in different political, a different political era and outside the political movement that consumed Ilyas emerges from her fast-paced editing together of personal and political footage and photographs from the past, recitations of her own poetry, her decoration of the film with motion graphics, and the psychedelic colors of the degraded video footage of PLO activities that her father has given her. The decoration, as well as Shufani's editing, interrupts any sort of nostalgic engagement with the older material and its masculinist ethos. Shufani herself speaks of the film as an homage to the father who she came to love and respect through the making of the film. But a degree of skepticism about the Palestinian project also emerges. At one point, she edits together multiple vehement critiques of Yasser Arafat and his cronies that her father made over the years, creating an impression, impression not only of political consistency, but also vehement partisanship. Thus, Ilyas Shufani's political commitment and ideo ideological consistency is both admired and critiqued, a sign of moral rectitude, but also inflexibility contributing to the fractious nature of politics within the Palestinian revolution. Basma Sharif's film, O Persecuted, which I briefly described above, has been described as a post-Palestinian film in that it dares to contemplate the possibility of an identity that is not tied to a future Palestinian state. Such works do not return to the past for inspiration or answers, but rather accentuate the distance separating the past from the present. Some of these works may be elegic in tone, but they avoid regret or explorations of past mistakes, grievances, or missed opportunities. In a world not ours from 2012, a first-person documentary about life in Ayn al-Hilwi refugee camp, Mahdi Flayfel, a European Palestinian who returns periodically to the camp to visit his grandfather, interweaves his own nostalgia for the camp with the story of Abu Iyad, a friend and camp resident constrained by the extremely limited prospects available to young men, young men there. A World Not Ours works simultaneously as an intimate, loving, and damning portrait of the camp, as the sight of Flayfel's cherished childhood memories and the sense of belonging they gave him, and of his gradual awakening to the cruel disparities that separate his privilege from Abu Iyad's constraints. Flayfel's film also works contrapunctally with militant cinema of the past, although he makes sparing use of that footage, relying instead on home videos shot by his father and uncles. In a world not ours, in stark contrast to the sense of urgent purpose characterizing the PLO films, young men have nothing to do. Meaningful armed struggle has been replaced by empty boasting about guns and violence. A heroic brother dies, leaving behind a frustrated and psychologically fragile sibling. A cohesive ideology lives on in vestiges of commitment among an older generation of Palestinians, but is no longer meaningful or useful to young men today. A world not ours is a requiem for an era. The film ends with Abu Iyad's failed attempt to emigrate to Europe. Life outside Ayn al-Hilwi is not a world for him, but the world of collective belonging that Falafi remembers from his childhood is also a world no longer accessible to either of the film's protagonists. As for the film's bleak foreclosing of, uh, uh, as, as, as such, the, film's bleak, the film is bleak foreclosing the Palestinian revolution and the post-1967 emancipatory ethos that characterized it for Palestinians of the 21st century. However, this is not the end of the story. In experimental new works that are no longer simply post-Palestinian, but also post-catastrophe, that engage with old images by refusing to lament a loss, Kamal al-Ja'afari's recollection from 2015 comes to mind, and perhaps Basma Sharif's new work, 
Urobodos, which was just released and I haven't seen yet, um, come to mind. A new chapter in Palestinian filmmaking is being written. Thank you. I'm not a big uh, Bel Beldrihard aficionado. Um, my, my title, um, and that'll become really obvious as soon as I start reading the paper, but the title is sort of a, um, uh, getting at this, um, the kind of uh, gestures I'm making in the paper, attempts I'm making, a uh, series of attempts is really what this paper is, to sort of um, think beyond this whole idea of 67 as this kind of traumatic thing that, that changed everything. So it's looking at kind of continuities in cultural history and especially in the responses of intellectuals um, um, and what the usefulness of kind of teasing out those continu continuities and getting around this whole idea uh, of the war is like this trauma that started a whole new trajectory in Arab culture, what the usefulness of looking at continuities might be. So um, in a memorable moment of jocular indignation from 1993, Edward Said uh, concluded an interview with the journal Radical Philosophy with a comment directed toward the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard. Having spoken extensively of the U.S.-Iraq War of 1991, Said ended by turning to the lack of resistance inside the U.S. Uh, and the collaborationist spirit within the American media. Carving an exception for radio, he reiterated that the rule was still proven since the first Bush administration had silenced such radio discussions by waging what he called, quote, a television war, end quote. The use of this phrase led to the following exchange. Question, in Baudrillard terms? Answer, probably not. What did he say? Question, Baudrillard said it was a hyper-real non-event. Answer, good old Baudrillard. For that, I think he should be sent there with a toothbrush and a can of Evian or whatever it is he drinks. <laughs> Although the historical context for the exchange is the aftermath of the Gulf War as an inauguration of the new post-Cold War American militarism. The intellectual context also merits attention. Baudrillard's book-length essay, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, which appeared first as a series of comments published simultaneously in French in Liberation and in English in The Guardian, also critiques the way most media package the war. Media's creation of a heavily traditional narrative of war suggested for Baudrillard a nostalgia for armies clashing on battlefields in an old-fashioned way. Uh, irrespective of the actual events that seemed a completely different sort of conflict, something closer to an overwhelming violent police action to invoke Hart and Negri's discussion uh, of conflict after the Cold War. Although Badriard's text was not generally seen as helpful by anti-war activists and intellectuals, in the context of the French anti-foundationalist tradition of which it, uh, uh, out of which it came, Badriard's study could be read as attempting to create a space for engagement within an intellectual tradition that had tended toward quietism, especially since May of 1968, but really long before that. Apparently, Said was not disposed to see the text as helpful. However, 1993 was the same year that he published Culture and Imperialism, a text that should be read as a culmination of two decades' worth of movement in Said's thought that had eventually turned away from the kind of emphasis on concepts like hyper-reality that fled the tradition of French theory a tradition that he had served as a major interpreter of in the United States during the 1970s. The very title of Baudrillard's text, however, would have represented for Said by 1993 everything problematic about enthusiasm for continental philosophy's rampant ahistoricism. Said had first cited but also distinguished himself from Foucault in Orientalism in 1978, then publicly distanced himself from what he viewed as a quietism in Foucault and among Foucauldians in traveling theory in 1982, Finally, by the time he published Culture and Imperialism a decade later, a book who, which he called Orientalism's sequel, Said had fashioned the method of contrapuntalism as what seemed a profound modification, if not uh, almost a, an explicit rejection of the older book's resort to discourse analysis. At issue for Said was the notion of the Arab subject as disposable within intellectual culture, a mere postmodern fragment to fill out the textual economy of the Western radical. An inventory of the intellectual context in which Said and Baudrillard operate is significant because the consideration of ideas as the product of a particular political occasion is precisely at issue in Said's differences with the anti-foundationalist strain in European thought. The notion of traveling theory, for example, his essay from 82, requires that one think of place and time at the same time one engages with knowledge production. 
Furthermore, Baudrillard's critique and Said's comment on it call our attention to the special place of war in the production of knowledge and the production of narrative in which all intellectuals engage. And I'm operating on a distinction here, of course, between intellectuals on the one hand and uh, what we might classify as theoreticians, critics, other types of uh, philosophers, other types of people who produce knowledge that where engagement might not be as, as um, essential to the definition. Although wars make it difficult for intellectuals to eschew their responsibility to take on issues of pressing socio-historical significance, they also make it difficult to think historically and systematically in that they appear as discrete and clearly defined events with winners and losers, providing a narrative that might easily sweep away systematic analysis of class structure, for example, or historical evolution of a society across generations, six days that shook the world, that kind of thing. In this sense, it is fairly easy to read Said's career as one of the many trajectories that was changed by the trauma of June 1967. So of the 67 war, Said says in another interview, quote, around that time I was serving on a jury, the day the war began, June 5, was my first day as a juror, I listened to the reports of the war on a little transistor radio. Uh, how were we doing, the jurors would ask. I found I wasn't able to say anything, I felt embarrassed. I was the only Arab there, and everyone was very powerfully identified with the Israelis. Also during that summer, which I spent in New York, I became connected with the Arab political world. I suddenly found myself, after 16 years of being in the United States, back in touch directly with the Middle East and the Arab world." End quote. After this uh, experience, one definitely detects a new direction in Saeed's concerns. The first clear indication of this is the short essay, The Arab Betrayed, published in 1970 um, in a volume that uh, Ibrahim Abouloud encouraged him to contribute to and helped put together. Um, these are Arab, uh, it's a collection of Arab intellectuals responding to the 67 war, and in it, Said first tries out some of the ideas and even some of the same anecdotes that will eventually develop into his classic Orientalism. However, the emphasis in the earlier text is on the American scene how images of and attitudes about Arabs circulate specifically within the United States. When Old World Orientalism is mentioned, it's, it's, oh, it's surprising how positively the European Orientalist tradition is valenced in light of Said's later writing. And so here's a quote uh, exemplifying that. In, in the case of the British and the French colonialists, dealings with the Arab were balanced if not finally moderated or redeemed by, enthusiasms, by enthusiasts like Dowdy and Blunt, who deeply acknowledge the presence of the Arab and European consciousness. What is strikingly apparent here is how little human space is occupied by the Arab in the American mind." End of quote. Said's initial response to 67 places an emphasis on Arab humanity that will grow eventually into a critique of the same continental philosophy that initially enables his move away from phenomenal, phenom, phenomenal, I've been on a, had a long plane trip yesterday, so, <laughs> phenomenological readings of canonical British literature. While there is a manifest difference that can be traced from the Arab betrayed through Orientalism, traveling theory and culture and imperialism to the Baudrillard interview, the increasing emergence of this emphasis on global humanism constitutes the continuity of the Arab intellectual in America from the event of 1967 through to the post-Cold War era of American empire. An activist concern with the universalization of humanism emerges in Said's thought after 1967 and evolves over the decades, but the nature of this concern does not become fully apparent until he has reworked the issues that concern him through several works. Continental theory allows him to subvert the American pragmatist tradition both before and after 1967, but becomes less useful the more this critique evolves. While it may be clear in some respects that 67 changed Said, the main continuity running through his career is the sense that the United States inevitably instills in the Arab-Palestinian intellectual um, of being, quote, out of place, which you all remember is the title of his memoir. Although the strategies to get at this systemic cultural aggression evolve, from, from evolve through these different stages, emphasizing British canonical writing as a worldly alternative to the United States, using continental thought to critique American critical method, and finally directly employing a Gramscian critique of US foreign policy in the cultural sphere. A comparison with the Moroccan philosopher Abdullah Lattawi, 
uh, contemporary and interlocutor of Said's might help illustrate the evolution in Said's thought that I'm trying to emphasize at the same time uh, further reinforcing the important cultural continuities that, that uh, surround the, the June War. Lottery's best known work in the United States is the crisis of the Arab intellectual traditionalism or historicism. Um, and it's just as much a response to the 67 war as our Orientalism and the Arab betrayed. Crisis also includes some trenchant criticism of the American scene and U.S. attitudes toward the Arab world. But there are also several important distinctions between the work of Lottawi and Said that are helpful in thinking about responses to the war within Arab thought. Uh, crisis is a rich, if at times frustratingly cryptic text, and can be read for multiple purposes. Given more time, the specificity of its own critique of Orientalist thought as an inspiration for Said that actually seems to shape the direction of his thinking about the Arab and global humanism for years after Orientalism would definitely deserve consideration. And I've tried to document how that works in, uh, uh, in a book chapter, which, is, as Marie mentioned, hopefully will appear one day. Um, but given today's form, the question of the text as a response to the June War calls for our attention. The lectures compiled in the book were delivered in the early 1970s in various Arab world centers of learning, and thus Lottawi contextualizes them as intended for Arab readers. This sense of audience immediately distinguishes the two, Lottawi and Said. Um, Lottawi begins, uh, begins the work, quote, what, what interested my listeners was not so much the positive results of Arab nationalism, but the failures of these movements. For the questions uh, that the interlocutors were asking, given the situation around 1970 was this. Why, in spite of all our efforts, are we facing the same difficulties our parents and grandparents faced? End of quote. Here, as throughout the text, the emphasis on continuity is striking. Although 1967 was a traumatic event, the definitive rupture, much of the analysis propounded by Lottawi could have uh, been applied to the years before the war. And in fact, was in his earlier book, L'Ideologie et Arabe Contemporaine, Assez Critique. Um, and, and so, as such, Lottawi even begins to cite the earlier study when he gets to the conclusion of uh, the crisis of the Arab intellectual. Lottawi offers in the text a thesis, in the, later in the crisis of the Arab intellectual, the thesis that a reconsideration of historicism can best address the crisis in method that plays intellectual work in the region. <coughs> Although the book itself suggests an old-fashioned quality to this emphasis by calling attention to its distinction from the work of Badrard's fellow travelers in French intellectual circles, because he emphasizes historicism, Lottery's specific notion of historicism is really more innovative than his own comparison to French trends would, would suggest. For Lottery in this and other works, uh, infuses the concept of historicism with a sense of what Dupesh Chakraborty might call historical difference. Geohistorical location plays a vital role in intellectual work. Um, Lottawi insists on, playing the, on, on placing the intellectual in a particular location, making distinctions not, nearly, not merely between third world intellectuals and European Marxists, or Nahdawis and Orientalists, but also between German thought at the time of Marx um, and thought in the more industrial advanced regions of Europe. In my previous readings of this book, um, historicism's invocation of the Arab intellectual's relationship to the region before European colonization struck me as a dominant motif. Reading the same study as a response to the June War, however, brings to the fore the text critique of class structure in the unequally developed and economically dependent Arab societies during and after the colonial era. The class of technocrats entrenched in Arab society since before the independence movements came to fruition and has enfeebled Arab political and intellectual social culture in Lattery's reading. This petty bourgeois class is the primary beneficiaries of the preservation of the status quo, blocking a serious engagement with the historical, since such an engagement can only do them harm. For this reason, Lattery concedes, quote, we must recognize that the chances for a general rationalization of Arab society are very much reduced and even unlikely for the system carries within itself the efficient cause of its perpetuation, end quote. In such an ahistoricist environment, the first goal of the Arab intellectual must be to create a new commitment to historical understanding, without which, Lottery believes, innovative thought that is liberated from derivative and dependent thinking cannot begin. This class critique offers a rich context through which to understand yet another 
uh, example, moving to the penultimate section of this. Uh, Salon Ebrahim's novel, 67. Um, the challenge presented by this text's organization is the way the title immediately calls the reader's attention to the war, but the novel then sidelines it for most of the narrative. Notwithstanding the middle chapters, it describes street scenes in Cairo during the six faded days. From the start, however, the opening scene of a New Year's Eve party filled with decadent flirtation, drinking, and dissipation redirects the reader toward the radical idea that the novel 67 is about a year. That's, in other words, 67 is turned into a, is changed from being a war into an uh, actual calendar year. Um, so it's about a year in a bedraggled society, not the year that a society collapsed. In this opening scene, we learn that the narrator protagonist is attracted to his brother's wife. An affair is initiated, and this act of family betrayal absorbs the narrative focus from much of the remaining novel. Um, I'm being a little bit descriptive because this is, uh, novel is, uh, hasn't been published yet, but um, I'll say something about that in a second. When the war suddenly inserts itself in the story, the tragedy plays the role of a relatively arbitrary interruption to the more general portrait of bourgeois decadence. That the protagonist is a writer working for an Egyptian newspaper has a double-edged quality. On the one hand, his profession, journalist, marks him as the embodiment of the technical classes that the colonial system produced and that Lottery critiqued. Uh, and there's nothing all that 67-ish about that. Right? On the other hand, the press played a notorious role in the June War. And any reader of the novel cannot help but consider this, especially after reading passages like this following one. And this is a scene where the narrator is, the, the journalist narrator is sitting at his desk and he's fending off these really banal conversations from his coworkers that keep coming by. And he's been trying to get rid of somebody who's asking him whether it's good to get married when you're young or when, you, or when you're old. And he gets rid of him and then, and then this uh, uh, next person comes by. Quote, Ali came in looking for the newspaper. I said I didn't have today's edition. He said he was looking for any newspaper to use him <laughs> in the bathroom. Uh, I, gave, I gave him an old paper that he, he tore into strips. Uh, then he said uh, it wiped up faster than normal toilet paper, end quote. Um, so 67 was written quickly during the summer in, in Beirut in 1968, but will only be published in book form for the first time this June. It is Ibrahim's second novel in terms of the order of the competition after his uh, short novel, Tilka uh, that's now, is that the new translation's name? That's now. The smell of it is that. The, the new correct translation is that smell. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there, yeah. There's two translations, to yes. Tilka or that, or that smell, or the smell of it. Um, uh, so briefly, it is worth noting how similar are these first two short novels. Uh, the one written before, right before the war, and the other, this other written right after the war. Both employ a flat, almost uh, monotone style, commensurate with a portrait of social alienation presented in each story. Both emphasize the quotidian grotesque as a provocation and critique of the status of Arab letters in the 1960s. Um, these and other connections, through these and other connections, the continuities between the novels actually bring to the fore Ibrahim's critique of the, of the 67 crisis as an almost inevitable exposing of the nationalist myth in terms available even before the fireworks of the six days. A last example offers a suggestion of a later direction of such critiques, even as it gestures toward the present. In Ottawa Saleh's El Multasarun, and Ottawa Saleh was a, maybe he's not as famous as these others, but equally important, was an uh, Egyptian activist um, and writer who um, was a leader in the student movement that um, uh, the student movement in Egypt in the early 1970s. Um, that shook the early Sadat administration that was also a, a response to the 67 war. And Mubtasarun is her, her account of, how, of the failure of that movement. Um, uh, and she committed suicide in the 1990s. So um, Mubtasarun will appear in English next fall in a brilliant, brilliantly translated and annotated English version by Samah Salim. Um, the continuities of the class critique after 1967 come into even sharper focus. So Saleh's emphasis is on the student movement. Um, as I just said, one way to summarize her critique would be that she is concerned with the way daily lives called into question the extent of radical commitment among the ostensibly radical in Egypt. 
and this adds significantly to the types of critiques one might find in the work of Said or Al-Adawi. For Saleh, also, continuities can be traced between the pre- and post-67 challenges that eventually blocked any profound movement for social change in Egypt. Here's a typically scathing passage uh, dealing with the influence of the generation of intellectuals critiqued by Ibrahim and Ladawi on student activism during the Sadat era. Quote, instead of leaving us to our own devices or giving us the space to work out our living reality and to let experience sift out uh, left from right, they nursed us on their poison milk. These prior internecine conflicts had devastating consequences. The student movement inherited them before the real world could shape its growth because certain individuals deliberately molded a handful of people into material with which to settle old scores." End quote. Salim has turned to this text as a historical comment on more recent events, and in doing so suggests the continuity of tradition within the region that is, uh, that is critical historicist, and that includes Arwa Saleh and the other writers um, I have focused on, um, other dissidents. Um, so far, such dissidents are perhaps fewer than we would want, uh, given social circumstances and outside pressure, uh, uh, too few perhaps to formulate a radical historicist discourse particular to the region. Lottery's suggestion in 1976 was that such a critical consensus around the historicist turn would lay the groundwork for what he called creativity, adding, quote, Creativity, as much cultural as political, must wait till later with a sort of historical fatalism that will not be accepted, I readily admit, by those who for decades have been eagerly awaiting an, an Arab springtime, an event that is today more uncertain than ever, end quote. Today, few would be willing to claim that the Arab springtime lottery wrote of in 1976 has arrived. In such critiques, however, might not there be the beginnings of a tradition of geohistoricist thinking that could pave the way for real creativity? I should just say it's really unusual that a historical event um, uh, that, that liter literary critics and cultural critics are invited, let alone to invited to dominate. Uh, so thank you for this. It's, it's a real treat to, to see colleagues I've known for a long time, but we don't get to see each other very often. My fear was that we were all going to be um, talking <laughs> about the same things, and we're not. And it's really great, uh, as a person who had to go third, um, to not repeat uh, what's already been talked about. Um, for Arab poets and writers, the June War was a shock and an occasion for weeping, self-critique, and even self-flagellation. To hear the urgency or even hysteria of that moment we only have to recall the opening lines of Nazar Qabbani's well-known poem, Margin Notes on the Dossier of the Setback. My friends, behold the death of that old language and the ancient books. To you I bring the news of the passing of our words worn out like old shoes and the death of whorish vocabularies, sarcasm and curses. I announce for you, for you, the end of the thinking that led to the defeat. Whereas there was a consensus about the existential nature of the military defeat, Arab intellectuals differed on the nature of its causes. For some, it was due to a betrayal and treason, a failure to properly modernize or to fully commit to Marxist, Nasserist, or Ba'athist models of revolution. For others, such as uh, Sadiq Jalal al Azam, the defeat was the direct consequence of a poverty of thought and language whereas for others it was due to blind adherence to authority and tradition. For the Syrian poet Adunis, it was all of these things at once. Writing in the journal El Adab in 1968, Adunis wrote, our masses are not up to the level of the revolution. When the revolution surrenders to them, it betrays itself. When it abandons them, it dies. We must realize that the societies that modernized did so only after they rebelled against their history, tradition, and values. We must ask our religious heritage what it can do for us in our present and future. If it cannot do much for us, 
we must abandon it. Now, in light of this body of writing, it's remarkable how differently the event was absorbed by the Palestinian poets and intellectuals who lived inside Israel. While they appreciated the enormous impact of the war on Arab regimes, they didn't talk about it in terms of defeat, hazima, or setback, naqsa. As Mahmoud Darwish put it in a 1969 interview, quote, as a writer, the war didn't have a sudden effect on me. It didn't turn my thoughts upside down. It didn't crush my ideals as it so thankfully did to those of, my, of the Arab poets outside my country. I wasn't sitting up in a pigeon tower needing to be convinced of the necessity of going down to the street. But the war was a painful truth teller and forced some writers to discover core realities. Fedra Tukhan's poetry, for instance, took a sharp turn immediately after Nablus was occupied. During our first meeting in Haifa, I said to Fedwa, not a month has passed since the occupation, your occupation. What do you think about all these long discussions about poetry? Then I couldn't help but add, quote, I hope there's some benefit from, what, from all that's happened. Let Nazar Kabani come visit us in Haifa. <laughs> Kabani never did visit Haifa, but others did. Similarly, the poets and writers of Haifa and Nazareth used the occasion to tour the West Bank and to meet with writers and poets they'd never met, or family and friends they hadn't seen in decades. The exchanges and conversations that developed out of these meetings were as transformative as they were unexpected. Within weeks or months, it was clear to Palestinian in intellectuals on the inside that one of the most paradoxical consequences of the June War was that it managed to put an end to the 20-year siege on Palestinian life in Israel. As welcome as this outcome was, the fact that it came about through military defeat rather than victory only accentuated the abject state of local Palestinian society, whether living as third-class citizens in the Jewish state or living under the new military occupation. In this context, it's not surprising that Palestinian citizens of Israel spoke about the war and its aftermath in terms of meetings that were as sad as they were happy, and reunions that, on the one hand, reaffirmed Palestinian connections, and on the other, reminded Palestinians of the divisions that separated them. The literature of this period is dominated by this motif. Importantly, this motif of reunion is fraught, incomplete, and even troubling. Before I discover, dis discuss this in one literary work, Emil Habibi's Six Day Sextet, I want to touch on three examples that appear in a, a new book that uh, you should all know about, Maha Nassar's New Study of Palestinian Intellectuals Inside Israel, entitled Brothers Apart, due to come out uh, fairly soon from Stanford University Press. In the first example, Nassar uh, recounts the story of the Haifa intellectual, Hana Abu Hana, who took a car trip through the West Bank in the months following the war. Abu Hana and his wife visit her sister in Ramallah, it is the first time they have seen each other in 20 years. And then Abu Hana drops in on an old friend who asked, shall we thank the occupation in whose shadows this meeting occurs? Yet it is the reason for our separation in the first place. In the second example, a young intellectual, Salman Matur, writes of his first trip to East Jerusalem in 1967 as a journey of self-discovery, or Arab self-discovery. Upon, and I'm quoting here again from Mahan Nassar's account, upon seeing a copy of the Egyptian newspapers Al Ahram and Al Jumhoreya, or the Lebanese journals Al Adab and Al Adib, I felt at that time as if I was embracing the Arab world. Along Salah Hadin Street, you don't hear anything around you except Arabic, and everything you see is written in Arabic, and the people are calling out in the open market selling Arab goods. It was this, as if I had stepped through a large portal and entered the Arab world. Right, so th this, they're, they're talking about the occupation here. Israeli officials correctly understood that these meetings between West Bank and 48 Palestinians were transformative, and that they could undermine the fragile system of control, which had, for almost 20 years, relied on a policy of isolating and separating Palestinian communities inside the Jewish state. And here I refer to a recent book of, um, of uh, Shira Robinson's on the subject. I want to give one last example from Mahan Nassar's work, when she narrates the story of how the poet Samih al-Qasim 
was detained by the Israeli police in early 1969. After questioning the poet about contacts he'd made while taking a tour of the occupied territories, the Israeli police detained him for weeks on charges of conspiracy. And there, in Damon prison, El Qasim meets prisoners who'd been brought in from all over the occupied territories, from the West Bank, from Gaza, and the Golan Heights. As Nassar puts it, after years of writing about the need for Arab unity and lamenting the barriers that keep Palestinians in Israel from having contact with other Arabs, it was in prison that they were finally carrying out a unique type of Arab unity." End quote. Now, as I hope to show you in the time I have, there's no better text than Emil Habibi's six-day sextet for tracing this motif of imperfect, incomplete, and troubled meetings. As Habibi put it many years later, and I quote, I wrote the six-day sextet during the first year of the occupation. If they'd called it the Seven Days War, I would have written it as a septet instead. I wanted to flip the word on its back to see the other face of this war's tragedy. A prisoner, separated from his family for 20 years, wakes up one day to loud noises in the prison court courtyard. Suddenly, he finds his entire family gathered around him, with him. After all the rupture and isolation, how is he supposed to feel about such a reunion? Can we even call that a reunion? The sextet first appeared in the pages of El Jadid, a legendary Arabic language monthly of politics and culture established in 1953 as an organ of the Israeli Communist Party, or Maki. Like other literary publications in Beirut or Cairo, El Jadid translated poetry and essays from a wide range of languages and engaged actively in questions of modernism, literary commitment, and cultural critique. Unlike those other journals, however, the circulation of El Jadid was confined to one city and a handful of towns and villages. It's difficult to exaggerate the accomplishments of this little journal, uh, which is not easy to find uh, in, in, in every library and which did not circulate anywhere else in the Arab world. At various times, it employed Hana Abu Hana, Tawfiq Zayad, Amil Toma, Samih Al Qasim, and Mahmoud Darwish as editors. And it formed, despite the embargo, one of the most vibrant journals of the entire Arab world until its demise in 1991. This text, the Six Day Sextet, appeared over the course of six issues in the magazine between April and September of 1968. Although the stories were published under the pen name of Abu Salam, readers would have recognized the author immediately. Over the years, Habibi had been publishing many pieces in El Jadid and in its sister newspaper, El Itihad, sometimes under his own name, sometimes anonymously, and sometimes under various pen names. In any case, the light touch of his prose and the biting sense of humor were as good as any signature. It's never really satisfying to talk about literature in the third person, and so I need to apologize in advance. The point of literature is to read it, so I'm just trying to give you a, a sense of um, how neat this book is. Um, some of these pieces have been translated, so if you're interested in reading them and you don't read Arabic, I can send you some, some, some links to that. Um, uh, but for now, I just have to give you an overall sense uh, of what it's like. Um, the first thing to say about the story, about these stories, is that each one sketches a meeting that is troubled and incomplete. In most cases, the reunions are between people, old friends, old loves, people who might have met earlier were it not for the partition. But the encounters are always, they always involve other things, places, things, stories, memories, songs, and poems. And there's something that's always equally unraveling. So these are stories about coming together, but also unraveling. In the first story, a young boy inside Israel, from the only family in a village without relatives, meets his cousin and uncle for the very first time. As joyful as the encounter is, tensions break out between the West Bank cousin and the other kids in the neighborhood. By the story's end, the protagonist grasps the precarity of their attachment, and he begins to wonder what will happen when Israel withdraws from the West Bank. A relevant question in 1968, and even more relevant today in 2017. A question mark, therefore, hangs over this reunion between cousins. In the second story, a friend from his town, uh, uh, the narrator uh, of the story, um, tells the story uh, of, of how a friend of his approaches him for the first time in 20 years. 
and asks him about another mutual friend from their childhood. As the story develops, we hear the story of this other friend and how in 1947, he had loved a girl from the West Bank and promised to marry her in the following year. When the Nakba of 1948 occurs, the two lovers are separated never to meet again. The narrator tells us how this man, his old acquaintance, had gone on a quest to find out what had happened to the lovers after all these years. When the West Bank is open, he gets in a car and goes. And while visiting the West Bank, he actually had found the same girl who was now married, um, but who had nonetheless held on to the same almond blossoms that were a token of her engagement to this other young man, their mutual friend. The narrator's old friend from his village is desperate to remember the name of that young man in the love story, but the na narrator is unable to help him. The man goes away, still trying to remember the identity of the protagonist of this other love story. At the end, the narrator reveals that the young man of this love story was the same confused man in the village, that the protagonist he was trying to remember was himself. The man had indeed gone on a tour of the West Bank and met his old love, but his repression was so total that he never recognized her. In the shadow of this lost memory, their meeting both happens and doesn't happen. In another story, we meet an old rag and bone seller who's, in whose junk shop, the property looted from Haifa homes in 1948, mingles with property looted from Golan Heights in 1967. Another tells the love story of activists from opposite sides of the Green Line who meet in a series of joint protests uh, inside Israel and in the West Bank, only to be separated again in Israeli prisons. The details of the various stories begin to add up and get tangled up in one another. Motifs repeat and proliferate and change. Situations, characters, and phrases, phrases repeat so often that it's sometimes difficult to remember which story we're in. And this confusion, I want to point, I want to argue, is precisely the point. While each story is self-contained, they're also in conversation with one another through an aesthetics of repetition and doubling. While critics have tended to discuss the work as a collection of stories and have tended to think of it as less in, in the body of Habibi's work because it's not a novel, I think this was mistaken. From the moment it first appeared in April 1968, the sextet was published and named, therefore conceived, really as a single work, not a collection of stories. And the form, I want to argue, is something between the, the form of novel and uh, between the, novel, the form of story and novel. And if folks are interested, we could talk about what this might mean for Palestinian identity and Habibi's career. Um, but just in the time that remains, let me, let me um, spell out some of, of this aesthetics by retelling the final story of the sextet and, dis and discussing really briefly how it folds back into the other narratives of the work. So each of the six stories begins with lines from a poem or song, such as Raja'una or uh, Zahrat al Madain, sung by the Lebanese singer Fairuz. While the meaning of these lines is never made clear, sometimes, it's seen, sometimes there is an, an explicit connection with the, the content of the story, sometimes not. Nonetheless, they tie the stories together in a ligamental or lyrical way, like a radio broadcast drifting over borders as if they don't exist. And in fact, this is the, this, you, you can almost see Habibi listening to Fairuz being broadcast from Beirut as he's writing these stories. The final story, Love in My Heart, begins this pattern by quoting lines, however, from a Jahali poet, from a Jahali poet, which we are told and a poem, which we are told, was never sung by Feruz. The story then begins by reflecting on the fact that while Feruz sings with warmth and feeling, the th songs she sings were composed by others. In the same way, Habibi, the author, and his unnamed narrator seem to be explaining that the story we're reading was not really by him, but by others. Um, as a fiction writer, who is really a journalist, the narrator is nothing more or less than a singer singing great songs composed by others. The narrator then mentions that on a recent visit to Leningrad, he was taken by his hosts to see the national monument to the 900-day siege of Leningrad, one of the most horrific episodes of the 20th century. Overwhelmed, the narrator and others wander through the ground, silent and sullen. In a small building next to the monument, they see the possessions and relic, relics of the victims of the siege, 
including a small diary by a girl, Panya Savicheva, who was no more than 12, 11 or 12 at the time. The narrator reads from the diary that's on display. And this, all, as some of you may know, this, all of this exists. The narrator reads from the diary, today grandmother died. This morning my little brother didn't wake up. Today they took away my mother. She was still sleeping. She hasn't come back. The narrator's Russian hosts tell him that the diary was found in the rubble of the city and that the girl, Tanya, died soon after the siege was lifted. The narrator, devastated by the story, promises his host that he will write about what he has seen. But after leaving them, he wonders whether he's up to the task. He's just a journalist, and what he writes about is everyday things. The narrator's block comes to an end when he happens upon the letters of a young woman from Jerusalem, now in Ramle prison. The narrator decides to change the name of the author of, the letter, uh, of these letters, these Palestinian letters, not to Tanya, but to Feiruz, because, as he says, the name moves us, it affects us. Feiruz, the girl who wrote these letters to her mother, was one of three girls, we're told, accused of plotting against the Israeli state. The story then goes on to quote these letters at length. In the first, the girl presents a wish list of items, magazines, hairbrushes, toothpaste, a watermelon, and chicken, uh, all sorts of things that she wants her mother to send them to her, send to her in jail. In a second letter, the girl tells her mother, who appears to be a 1948 refugee from Haifa, about her cellmate, a girl from Haifa, and how much they have in common, how they both listen to Feiruz, Abdul Wahab, and so on. Throughout the letters, the girl tells her mother not to worry. La uh, la and so on, and, um, and, and she tells her mother not to worry so often that we began to see the real desperation behind her words. We should worry. The narrator never presents the third letter, whose contents he tells us, we've already read in the false newspaper accounts of the trial of the Israeli policewoman who helped smuggle the, the letters out in the first place. I know this is a shaggy dog, but shaggy dog story, but, but that's sort of the point in Habibi's writing here. The story and the sextet end with the narrator reminding us that the reality here is of a friendship between characters who, quote, from a single people have, a, uh, these are characters who, uh, quote, come from a single people who have reu reunited after a long separation under a single roof, the roof of a prison cell. This is the metaphor of the post-67 uh, situation. Every element in this story resonates with situations, themes, and characters from the other stories in the work. Here, in this story as elsewhere, the tension between separation and reunion, and in Arabic, the, the repeating words are al and al They're only resolved, though, in the most fleeting ways. There's a doubling of a faraway story, Tanya's story, this, this Russian girl, with a local one, the girl from Haifa, uh, which repeats many, many other instances of narrative mixing throughout the sextet, where everyday stories of Palestinian life get tangled up in the plots of novels like The Tale of Two Cities and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and even the folk tale of Jubaina and the Blue Necklace. Within this, uh, there, there's also a prison story in this one, which doubles another prison story in the fourth text. There are instances of repetition as well, of um, Habibi's sly habit of misquoting. He's always misquoting in this work. In this particular case, he takes the words weapon in hand, fi idayya salah, from Abdul Wahab's 1967 song, Hayal Falah, and makes them into il hub fi qalbi, or love in the heart, the title of this, of this story. And it, we're never explained why. This narrator can't seem to remember correctly. With such an untrusty quoter of known poems and songs, what are we to make of this narrator? Indeed, the figure of the narrator is one of the most fascinating elements of the text itself, the position of the Palestinian intellectual on the inside in the face of, of, of the aftermath. The narrator in this story seems to be the same in the other stories, even though we're never sure. In some stories, he hails from Nazareth, in others, from Haifa or a village somewhere else in the Galilee. He could be a Palestinian everyman, observing and recording in the same right tone. But there's also evidence to think of him as something much more ambivalent, more reluctant. This hesitation comes through in the last lines of the third story. 
when the old rag and bones dealer, Um Rubavecchia, hands him a stack of letters, perhaps those same peasant letters of the last story. And the gift of these letters reminds the narrator of how his own grandmother used to tell stories about Hassan the Clever, Hassan el, el, el Shatar. Only she told the stories out of order, without beginning, without a proper ending. The kids called them amputated stories, Qasas Butra. After leading us on about the letters, the narrator decides not to tell us what they contained. He says, let's leave this story amputated or frayed. Let's finish writing it together. This ambiguous gesture between silence and authorship, between beginning and end, between separation and, reu and reunion, seems especially fitting for thinking about how the June War must have appeared to Habibi and others in the months that followed. Its meanings were unclear, even if its implications were not. But as Habibi's stories make exceedingly clear, while fiction could raise questions, the answers would be found outside the text, and the reunions would have to take place in situations like those of a prison cell. Thanks very much.